Welcome everyone to uh, Southport Historical Society's Tuesday Talk. Uh, my name is Mike Royal and I have a, some uh, fun guests with me today. Uh, we're going to be talking about Yopon Beach Pier and we're going to be talking about Long Beach Pier. Um, we're going to talk about all the fun times and the interactions those piers gave to both locals and to the tourists that came down. And when you think about Oak Island, uh, the piers were a major attraction. I think that that's one thing that both tourists and locals alike can identify with as attraction, as an attraction uh, that made them enjoy the beach experience so much more. There's something about a pier as you walk out and you're walking out over the Atlantic Ocean and you go all the way out to the end and you get that perspective of looking back at the shoreline. Uh, that's a pretty neat experience. And so I'm looking forward to hearing about uh, some of the memories that David Ratcliffe has of Long Beach Pier and also Tommy Robbins, who's our guest, that's going to be talking about Yopon Beach Pier. Um, this is considered Southport Historical Society's Tuesday Talk. Uh, we do this every month on the second Tuesday of each month. So uh, mark your calendars to join us every um, every month for the Tuesday talk. So with that, I'm going to let David Ratcliffe, I'm going to let you go first. And you tell us about the life and times at Long Beach Pier. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, I'm very happy and honored, actually, to be asked to join this, this presentation um, because Long Beach Pier was very important to me while I was growing up. And it was mainly between the ages of of five and 15 or 16 when I was, uh, when I had the most memories of Long Beach Pier because that was when my, my dad owned it and I used to spend time, I mean, I would leave school in Fayetteville, North Carolina, uh, you know, at the, the last day of school in June and go to Long Beach and be there for the entire time until the first day of school in Fayetteville and come back. So, so I, I, I do, uh, you know, appreciate that because of my age, quite frankly, some, some of the specific dates, my age my, might be a little fuzzy, not too far <laughs> off, but, you know, unfortunately I grew up in a family that didn't preserve a lot of stuff like this. So I'm, I really am calling on my, uh, uh, you know, on my memory, but um, are we going to start the, uh, I'll, I'll start your yeah presentation right now i'll just, Thank just you. hold on okay 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 we're good all right thank you bob um so basically what i want to do is just cover some pictures that i have been able to, to salvage of the of the pier during that particular uh period of time and some of the pictures are from when I was there, some of them were personal to me. Some of them are pictures that were shared with me by um, Cammie Ratcliffe, who was my Uncle Jimmy's uh, wife, et cetera. So anyway, it's just a conglomeration of stuff. Uh, the next slide, please. You should have it. Uh, okay, because I'm not seeing it, but that's okay. I'll just go to the next slide. So uh, the next slide is the picture of my family, which is basically me in the middle and my two brothers, Mike to my right and Bill to my left, my mother, Helen, and my father, Harvey, who uh, anyone who might have known him may have been more used to calling him Doodle because he was known as Doodle Ratcliffe and then my mom, Helen, and my two brothers. My brother, Mike, who I said is to my right, uh, is more closely aligned with Long Beach Pier because he was my dad's manager for the first couple of years after my dad uh, uh, bought it. Unfortunately, everyone in this picture is deceased now except me. Um, and that gives me a minute to mention that I did have a cousin named David Ratcliffe, who was the son of Jimmy Ratcliffe, who lived down there. And there's always a lot of confusion because unfortunately David is, is, uh, has predeceased. And so a lot of people oftentimes are surprised to see me pop up or my name pop up. 
because right. they, they think I'm no longer around. Uh, but anyway, uh, I am. The next photo is simply a photo of the home place in Southport. And this is how we got originally connected to uh, Long Beach. And I know, you know, in today's vernacular, it's all Oak Island and I get it. But I grew up in a time when it was Long Beach, Yopon Beach and Caswell. And so it's kind of hard for me to break out of that uh, remembrance of how it was thought about. Uh, Oak Island was sort of a big thing that we were all part of. And now, of course, it, it's all Oak Island. Uh, but we were originally, uh, my father's parents were originally rooted in Southport. Uh, my grandfather, Herbert Ratcliffe, was the uh, primary jailer for Brunswick County and worked right. at the, worked at the, um, uh, the jailhouse there, which is now a, a historical site, which you can actually go to, which is kind of cool, I think. But he was there. The house that you see was uh, their home. It was at the corner of Nash and Davis, uh, right across from the old uh, Southport Fire Department and Franklin Park. And so that was really my, my those are my earliest memories of being down there was before we had a place on Long Beach, we used to go and spend time at my uh, grandparents' uh, home. And in mm -hmm. fact, that, that top peak that you see with the window on the right side, that was my bedroom. And one of my earliest memories as a child is the horror that I felt having to sleep up in the attic <laughs> far away from everyone and wondering, you know, what murderer was going to come in and do away with me in this attic. <laughs> but I, I do remember that with great fear. Um, but anyway, that was my bedroom. Uh, and uh, it, it was always fun to stay there because I would go to Franklin Park, which I remember thinking as a child was the biggest, most expansive uh, resort area I had ever seen. And then I would walk down to the Cape Fear River and go into Southport and go to Leggett uh, Department Store and pick out a toy that was probably 49 cents. Uh, <laughs> as I got a little older, I went to the Amuse You Theater. And I do remember when they would stop the theater because they needed to fire up the furnace uh, with the, and then come back to the movie. So <laughs> those are... Those are kind of some of my early memories of, uh, uh, you know, of being in Southport. The next slide is a picture of my granny, Eva, who was my father's mother uh, and, uh, and me and my mother fishing at Kings Point in uh, Long Beach. Um, my dad had a Jeep, as you can see. And we're used hey, excuse to me, David, hold yeah. on a second. I, I don't think, Bob, I don't think the slides are advancing. They're not advancing from my perspective either. So I'm you. not sure. All Thank right, you let, me, that up. let me go out and come back in. So, David, while we're pausing to correct that, so I didn't make the connection that Mr. Radcliffe was your grandfather. I remember him very well growing up in Southport, and I bought a little bunny rabbit from him when I was a kid. He had a whole backyard full of rabbits. He absolutely, my, my, my granddaddy uh, was, he, he went from one thing to another uh, <laughs> like that. He used, he had fig trees in the backyard, so for a while it was selling figs and making fig jam. Then he had the bunny rabbits. Then he also had parakeets that he used to house back there, and those were always for sale. So, yeah, he always had a side hustle going on. Yeah, uh, yeah so that's interesting that you would remember that because he absolutely mm -hmm. did. Liz, are you seeing that? Yeah, that looks better. And then I think he was maybe three or four slides in. I was actually on to slide four, that, that slide right there. Yep, there you go, Bob. Thank you. All right, thanks, Liz. 
Yeah, that's the picture of, of me and I said my granny and then I evidently was having a good day because I had just caught a fish and yeah. my mother Helen uh, while we were out at, uh, at you know, at West End. Uh, Bob, go to the next slide, please. This was basically the same, I don't know if it was the same, yeah, it was the same day or my mother's breast the same, so it was the same day. <laughs> um, when we were again at Kings Point fishing, and as you can see, there's not a house to be seen uh, because Kings Point at that time basically had no development on it whatsoever. Uh, and you would drive the Jeep down and go across the dune, which I know is forbidden now, but then it wasn't. And you would set up and fish right at the inlet. So we were there, you know, we were fishing and we always caught trout and flounder and croaker and uh uh, spotted drum or, you know, I mean, those were sort of the main things that, you know, that we would catch, but that's one of the times when we were there. So that was really our connection, early connection to Long Beach before my, before my dad bought the pier. Next slide, Bob. Uh, so here's just a historical summary that was in the paper when Long Beach Pier was sold, and it's not completely accurate. You know, it does talk about the fact that the pier was built in the 50s by Jimmy Bigelow. Uh, and my dad bought the pier from Jimmy Bigelow. And, um, and he bought the pier in, and it was either 1959 or 1960. And here's where I'm a little fuzzy on my sp particular date, but that's roughly what it was. Um, and where the inaccuracy in this press release comes from is that Jimmy Ratcliffe, Harvey's youngest, I'll call him Doodle because that's how everybody knows him. Doodle's youngest brother, Jimmy, was brought on as a general manager, but not initially. Daddy basically ran the pier by himself uh, with, I mean, obviously with staff for uh, six or seven years. And then Jimmy was brought on, you know, as his general manager. Jimmy was a uh, salesman for the Lay's corporation and used to, you know, drive around and make sure everybody who was ordering Lay's was well stocked and whatnot. Daddy brought him on uh, as, as a general manager, but not at the beginning. The second thing that really was known about Long Beach Pier and sort of put it on the map is that it was the longest pier in the, on the North Carolina coast. Now, when Daddy bought the pier, it was not. When Daddy bought the pier, it was around 750 feet. But the original license for the pier when Jimmy Bigelow bought it, uh, I mean, Jimmy Bigford bought it, allowed it to go to uh, roughly uh, almost 1,200 feet. And it allowed for a T on the end. So because Daddy bought the pier, he, of course, bought the original license and was able to extend it. And that's Pretty much, I mean, that is what he did in order to help brand it and make it attractive. Um, his primary motivation for extending it is that fishermen, particularly king fishermen, would stand on the end of the pier and try to kingfish, and they would see kingfish jumping out in the distance, but they couldn't get to them. <laughs> so he, that was his primary motivation other than just marketing was to extend it to make it more valuable to, uh, to king fishermen. Next slide. And this is just a, you know, a random review of some of the uh, PR material that was offered at the beach. Probably the biggest uh, and uh, you know, most, uh, most prevalent was the hats, the Long Beach Fair hats. Uh, that he sold in order to, to, to promote, promote the pier. Next slide. As I mentioned, uh, there was a real interest in extending the pier because of the amount or number of um, uh, tarpon, covia, uh, kings, et cetera, that we saw. And I actually do remember this, oddly enough. This is when I really start to date myself when this tarpon was caught off of Long Beach Pier. Uh, it was about a 95 pound dolphin, I mean, 95 pound tarpon uh, that was caught off the pier. Uh, and that was 
that was big news. I mean, that was it was huge news that that tarpon, tarpon was 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 caught and brought up, and it really did get us a lot of press. And this was just an example of the the kind of press that it gave us. Next slide. This is how the pier ended up under my father's ownership. Um, if you look the middle, just a little to the right, and you see that opening, that opening with two windows on the left and the two windows on the right was the original uh, entrance to the pier itself. The, the two windows on the right was the basically where you checked in, got your ticket, got any bait you needed. On the left, it was um, a little cafe where you get hamburgers, hot dogs, the kind of place that would have uh, pickled eggs in a jar you know, on the counter, you know, yeah. and, and, and that was really what was available to the, pitch, to, the, to the fishermen that would go. My dad expanded to the right and the left and we'll look at some pictures of that. The little inset picture is the restaurant itself. Um, so what he ended up adding was a full sit down restaurant bar area. And then in the back, which you cannot see is, is the arcade. That's where the pool tables, the um, pinball machines, all that sort of stuff was for people, kids to go back there and, and really kind of enjoy themselves. Just a little side note about that area. It was never intended originally to be an arcade. It was originally intended to be a nicer version of a sit down restaurant where my dad was envisioning bringing in a band and music and people coming and having dinner and enjoying the music and that sort of thing. The problem is roughly in 1963 was when this was built, uh, he had a big grand opening. And I mean, a grand opening that he was pulling out all the stops. And you had to know my father well enough to know that pulling out all the stops was necessarily not his forte, <laughs> but he wanted it to be a big event. So it was a beach wide event and anybody and everybody that was of consequence and that was a resident was invited. Well, unfortunately, about two thirds of the way through the party, a fight erupted and, and it was not pretty. Um, and one of the members came over to our cottage, knew where my father kept his rifle, took it back, didn't, never fired the rifle, but basically butted a number of people with it. My father was so embarrassed and just so deflated by the whole thing that he shut it down as a restaurant, never reopened it, brought in pool tables and pinball machines. And from that point on, it became the arcade. So that was the ignoble uh, opening of uh, the Long Beach Pier Entertainment Center for, um, for Long Beach. Next slide. It's just a perspective of the pier. This was after it was extended and the T was put on the end. Um, so uh, as I said, it, it didn't quite double the length of the pier, but it came pretty close to doing so. So I did, you know, I happen to have this, have this picture and I wanted to show you um, sort of what the pier itself um, looked like after it was extended. Next picture. And again, just a perspective of the promenade. Uh, and the insert picture is the tackle shop and the grocery store. Uh, so again, that was where you would go up, you know, come into the pier, buy your, uh, buy your ticket for the day, which was a dollar. You could go fishing for a dollar. There were no costs just to go out and walk on the pier. Um, or and you could get your, your bait, which is basically shrimp and blood worms. And there, were live, there was live bait back on the pier. And then the grocery store was in the back. Um, so that's just a, just a, you know, an example of, of what it looked like and what the, the promenade of the pier itself looked like to the comment mentioned earlier. Yes, the pier, the pier was a drawing attraction just for people that wanted to walk and stroll out there and see people fishing and catch the perspective and, and that sort of thing. Next slide. 
And this was the end of the pier <clears throat> with the T-shaped end that I mentioned, which was in the original licensing of the pier itself. So again, just a perspective of what it looked like at that time with the T-shaped end. Next. That's me. <laughs> uh, that's me at about 12 years old, having gone out one morning and caught flounder. So lucky me. Um, most of my fishing on the pier was around flounder and trout, and that's what I did more often than not. In my little bit later years, when I was around 14, 15, 16, I used to do some king fishing. Um, I was way better at catching kingfish off of a boat than I was off of the pier. <laughs> but anyway, I was, uh, th this was a good morning for me uh, with my, uh, my early morning uh, flounder catch. Next pick. Just basically an ad, uh, you know, and publicity around the pier itself uh, from the early days on through later days. Um, but it really, um, you know, did have a brand to sell and tried to take advantage of a brand. Now you see in this ad, it references Long Beach Motel, which I'm going to get into because that was part of the attraction itself. Uh, but that was just early uh, advertisement for the pier. Next. As I mentioned, Long Beach Motel. Long Beach Motel was directly across the street from the pier. Uh, it was built as a fisherman's motel. So there was nothing fancy about it. You know, this would not have qualified as a Hilton by any stretch of the imagination. But it, uh, it was the was a 41 unit motel that daddy built across from the pier to accommodate uh, the fishermen. You'll note the ornamental iron decoration on the railings and on the signs. And that is because my father owned an ornamental iron company in Fayetteville, North Carolina that my oldest brother, Bill, ran. And so when he built the motel, he of course used the ornamental iron to sort of New Orleans it up a bit, uh, you know, in his, his presentation of the motel. Of course, the little gatekeepers at the top of the sign in hindsight was probably not a good idea, but at the time <laughs> it, it, uh, it was not too offensive, but I look back at it now and I'm like, oh my God, what was he thinking? But it was a different time and place. And that's sort of what it was. Next slide, please. And here again is a perspective of the motel and, and an internal view of the motel. Uh, and as I mentioned, it was not fancy, but it did have, you know, full kitchen, full bath, two double beds, dining table, you know, the whole nine yards. And so, um, you know, people could come in and rent a room and the, the nice thing about it was for fishermen who wanted to come and fish and didn't have a cottage and needed a place to stay, it provided that, but it also enabled them to bring their family so their family could then go to the beach and frolic in the waves and do whatever they were doing, you know, to if they weren't interested in fishing themselves. So that was a new phenomenon on Long Beach uh, at the time. At the time, Long Beach didn't have any motels. Um, so that was something sort of new and different that was brought, brought in and it was all sold at the same time, same time the pier was sold. Next slide. Uh, I mentioned my uh, youngest uh, uncle, uh, Jimmy, who was the youngest brother to Doodle. He was brought on as a manager. So this is just a picture of Jimmy uh, coming on and running uh, Long Beach Pier uh, at, you know, later in the in the span of my father's ownership. My father did give him an interest in the pier. And so when it was sold, he moved in, moved on with the new owners, you know, as a, as a partial owner. Uh, but he was the, uh, he, he was the youngest brother, the manager, and he was the father of the other David Ratcliffe. So for people that are confused, this was David Ratcliffe's father, Jimmy. Next slide. Just a real perspective of the pier itself. And this was after it was sold. This was, this was after the new owners had taken over. You can see the configuration of the T changed uh, to be different. You, uh, you can see there was another uh, sort of condo 
motel, I'm not even sure what to call it, development that, uh, that just right of the motel itself. Um, if you look behind the motel, that area when my dad owned it was a campground. So you could bring in a camper, park it, lease a spot for the season, whatever. Or there were places set up for, um, for tents as well. But that was behind the motel. And then just to the, to the left, there were like five small cinder block cottages. The very first times we ever started going to Long Beach Pier before my dad owned it, we stayed in one of those little cinder block cottages. And what I remember most about them is they, they were cinder block and they were cold. <laughs> but uh, but that, that, was the, that was what they were. And then just a little bit, literally just, you know, a, an eighth of an inch um, left of that was the cottage that we built after the original cottage, which was right next to the pier, was demolished. Now, I don't remember why it was demolished. There was a reason I don't remember that. But anyway, my dad had that lot over on the corner and he built that house and that house is still there. Next slide. This was after it was sold and the front was sort of tarted up a bit. Uh, that's Jimmy's car that is in front. <laughs> But that's what it, 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 it developed into after it was sold. Next slide. And again, just another perspective of the pier. Um, you can see there are pilings that are poking through the water and that has to do with a couple of mishaps. One being a shrimp boat running into the center of the pier one winter in a foggy night. Uh, and basically demolished the center of the pier and it had to, that part had to be rebuilt. And then there was some hurricane damage that I've got some pictures up later that you'll see. But that's basically what the pier looked like later in the 70s. Next slide. And just another perspective from the end when the pier was double decked uh, and looking back uh, toward, um, toward Oak Island itself. Next slide. Again, same perspective, just to give you a look you know, at what it looked like at that particular time. Next slide. Here, what's different about this picture is you can see the end has, is gone. And this had to do with Hurricane David in 1979. Hurricane David took the end of the pier. So the pier itself, as you can see from all the people on it, was still usable, but not the end. Next slide. And that's what the end looked like. <laughs> so um, yeah, though it sustained a lot of damage uh, during that particular storm, but it was ultimately rebuilt. Next slide. So Long Beach Pier was basically demolished in 2006. And this particular article ran through the history of the pier itself and talked about uh, what we just talked about in terms of this, of this uh, particular presentation. Um, I probably, I don't know that I even should say this, but I, I get questioned all the time from people who say, why was the pier destroyed uh, or demolished? Uh, and it was basically demolished as a result of a rather difficult divorce proceeding between the owner at that time and his spouse. And, uh, one thing led to another and the pier and the motel and the whole bit was, uh, was demolished. So that's my understanding. If that's wrong, please don't sue me. I'm just passing on information I have, but that's the information I have as to why the pier itself no longer exists. Next, uh, next slide. And these next slides are just some memorabilia that I did come over, uh, you know, about the pier itself. These were hats and t-shirts that were sold to promote the pier. Next. And these were just a couple of promo items. Well, not both of them. The one on the left was the key to the Long Beach, to a Long Beach motel room. And on the right was a letter opener that was a promo item for the pier itself. Next. Uh, again, a promo item a tray 
that would have been sold in the gift shop uh, of North Carolina and the tide tables that were always available for fishermen to pick up to sort of understand when the high and low tides uh, were going to be. And as you can see, this is a 1980 uh, tide table. Next. And finally here, uh, you know, on the right, we have just a picture of the Long Beach Fishing Pier tickets. So when you came in and you paid your dollar and you bought a ticket, this was stapled onto your shirt or your jacket or whatever. And that proved that you were a legitimate customer of Long Beach Pier at that point. Uh, on the left is a king mackerel fishing rig. And I don't know how many of you fish for kings, but basically the anchor was tied onto a line and cast out off the end of the pier uh, as far as you could cast it uh, to anchor the line. And then the on the uh, hook was assembled this rig and you would attach on the on the rick of the hook, hook you would attach a bait fish and it might be a bluefish, a menhaden, a pinfish, uh, whatever you could get your hands on. You basically attached and slid down the line so that when a king hit it, it would take off, it would bring up the anchor, would snag it, set the hook, and then you were on for the battle of catching the fish. Next. And this is my mom and dad, Helen and Doodle. Uh, this was their vacation in Hawaii after they had sold the pier uh, and the motel. Uh, it was something that, I mean, during this whole period of time when my dad owned the business in uh, Fayetteville and the Long Beach Pier, they never, ever really experienced much of a, a vacation as such. I mean, in the wintertime when the pier was closed, they would go down to Florida, but they never did any big time stuff. So this was just a picture of them in uh, going to Hawaii uh, after, after the sale. My dad owned the businesses and was the one that always motivated and drove the business, the, well, drove the, um, the attraction of customers to the business. My mother was the one that kept him out of jail because she was the bookkeeper. <laughs> and if my father had not had my mother, this would be an entirely different presentation. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but they were a team and they were a team that knew how to do it and did it right. So I always have a lot of very fond memories about growing up in Long Beach, and very fond memories about being involved with the pier. From the, from the earliest days, I had jobs every summer. My earliest job was to pick up the trash in the parking lot every day. And for that, I got $20 a week. Uh, and, uh, and then I moved on to doing everything from washing dishes to running the soda fountain to going out and helping catch live bait to, you know, whatever the case may be. But I was always on, on ready and on standby to take over whatever job my dad decided that, uh, that I needed to have. So I want to thank you for listening to me ramble and, uh, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm done. Thank you very much. Thanks, David. Really appreciate that. That was great. So there's going to be a time at the end for questions. I know you probably have a lot for David, but let's go ahead and get Tommy Robbins to come up and tell us about Yopon Beach Pier. Hey, Mike. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, <clears throat> Yopon Pier uh, actually was called Yopon Village. It was not even Yopon Beach. It was Yopon Village then. Uh, the uh, Barbies purchased uh, from E.F. Middleton the Yopon sector that we know uh, basically <clears throat> from Caswell to 79th Street in Long Beach. Uh, and that was called Yopon Village. Uh, as you see when Bob gets to show up and running, you'll see some streets and plots that were laid out. Uh, I was two years old when this pier was built. So, you know, I'm not going to know a whole lot in the beginning. But uh, it was built in it was built in 1955. Long Beach Pier, of course, was built in 56. And then uh, you had Ocean Crest Pier that came in after that. So uh, main, my main memories were at about starting at about age five. Uh, if we get uh, the slideshow going here. Not. OK, can you guys hear me? OK, there we go. Yeah, this was uh, original pier construction. Uh, in September of 55, uh, 
some of the Barbies people there uh, at the end. Of, it looks like Barbie Boulevard with the steel beams coming in. The uh, the Yopon Pier, the original, one was built with steel beams uh, with wood decking on it. Uh, next slide. There you go. Uh, there's a crane out there. I, I was not able to find out the company that did it. Uh, I'm still finding out things in, in the last few days here, and, and I will be finding out more. But this was the company with the crane out there laying the beams so that the decking and then everything else could be put on the lighting, the electrical, and the seats. But this was a for September of 55. This was uh, like almost a year after Hazel came through and ravaged everything. So they didn't have a period that was damaged, so they were a year later. Next slide. Uh, just some more scenes there of laying the beams. Uh, this is just starting out into the ocean with it, this portion here. Next. Uh, this is much further out uh, after they were laying some of the deck in to work on, uh, headed toward the end. Of course, this pier was not the longest pier in North Carolina, but it was very substantial. Okay, next. Uh, this is another scene. This is from the end of Barbie Boulevard, looking out to the pier. Uh, just basically all the stock steel laying around in the beams and everything during construction. Uh, next. Okay, this is an interesting picture here. Uh, this is at the end of Barbie Boulevard. This is where, well, all you guys know is where the circle was at to the left. Because right. uh, the road went all the way around. That was the big deal. And when you were young, then was circling, you know, circling Barbie and going back and forth. But this is looking, this would be looking west toward Long Beach. And there's nothing down there. <laughs> so, uh, it's 55 and there's wow. nothing around. So that's just the way it looked and the pavement ended at Barbie. And a lot of the Barbie family lived on Barbie Boulevard and Womble, which is the street before there, uh, straight in front of the pier. Next, there you go. This is a, a couple of pier pictures. Uh, after pretty much it was completed, the lighting was done. Looks like the benches, some of the benches and everything were done. This is, this is it, this is the original pier. September 55, finishing up. Okay, next. Uh, just some more shots. Uh, I was noticing how the decking was done uh, in the short boards and the seams were kind of all in line. Uh, what you see on the picture on the left, uh, if you look slightly to the left of the pier, you'll see the building there. That was the skating rink, uh, which now everyone mm -hmm. would know is 801 Ocean Event Center. Uh, next to that, right beside that, uh, okay, yeah, you can go, uh, yeah, that'll be, you can go ahead. Thank you. Uh, there you go. Just another shot of the pier from, uh, from Barbie perspective. Uh, I actually have a picture I'm looking forward to comparing with this with my 70 Cuda that I had almost in the same place as that car. Uh, but anyway, that's the pier pretty much completed with the braces at the bottom. Uh, this is, of course, the four. The uh, surf shop was built. I don't, that's going to show up. Uh, there's a sign, or I'm guessing a lifeguard chair that he noticed right there at the end of the street. But that's when you could drive all the way around, and it was kind of neat. And there wasn't very much for dunes there. Uh, there's actually huge dunes there right now. Uh, next. Okay, this is going up to the other end of Barbie. Uh, this building here still exists. This was the Yopon Village. Uh, I always called it the Barbie building. That was their real estate and their storage unit there in the end where they stored things and parks and pieces for the amusements and everything. That is now uh, what you would know as a Napa store. Uh, the Warren brothers had, that's the Napa store. And uh, of course you see nothing on the left because there was nothing there but for sale signs. Uh, this would be before the SO station was built. The SO station would be on that corner right there uh, beside this building. Uh, next slide. There's the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Yopon Village uh, rental building again, the office, which like I said, is now a Napa store. It was a, a beauty shop for a while and then became a Napa store. Uh, and I noticed the old phone booth out there for you young, young folks, that is a phone booth. But, uh, 
that was a, you can look at the age of these cars. This is saying still in 55. Okay, and that would be Womble Street to the left. This is just a one I threw in. This was the, uh, oh, you can go ahead. Uh, advance the slide. Uh, that would be the Sinclair Motel, the Coastal Motel, which is on the other side of Barbie on the main road, uh, which is owned by the Sinclair family, Maurice and Ann and their family. Okay, next. That's still there, by the way. That's called the Oak Island Inn now. Okay, this slide here shows looking from, uh, looking from the ocean up Barbie Boulevard uh, right after it was paved. Uh, there's a construction trailer there on the right. Uh, over on the left, uh, the first house you see there, uh, by the way, that first house there was Robert Sellers' house. He was a town employee. Uh, he was the garbage man, the uh, maintenance man. Uh, I think he was a dog catcher. He was everything. And I knew Robert pretty well. He has a family in Southport, actually. But that whole corner there now, I mean, the only lot that's not developed there right now is that very corner lot right behind that car. That everything else is totally uh, developed up, uh, like most places are. Uh, next slide. Okay, this is this is a cool picture. This is probably one of the Barbie Barbie family ladies. This was over on the uh, the Barbie side, looking toward the ocean. And uh, the beautiful live oaks and everything, which a lot of them are still there. And you still notice there's not a there's not much of a dune there, but that's uh, that's changed a lot now. Uh, next, uh, this house is still there. Uh, I'm thinking this might have been John Barbie's house at the time, uh, who's one of the, the Barbie brothers. Uh, there was Gib and John. Uh, there were sisters. Uh, Dudley and Carolyn, but I think this is probably where John lived at at the time. The house is still there, and that's in the middle. The grass there is in the middle of Barbie Boulevard. Okay, next. Uh, kind of the same thing. Next house down. Same, pretty much same perspective. Uh, next slide. Another another shot down Barbie looking straight south, which, uh, you know, as our beach runs, is a true east-west beach with uh, South 180 being straight out in the ocean. This is just another shot from in front of, this is uh, we'll about where Mistress Barbie, uh, her, the, which was the grandmother or the mother to the Barbie sons would live out. That's about in front of their home. Next. Uh, this was just a little flyer that the Barbies put out for Yopon Village. In the very beginning, uh, as you can read, you know, well-planned Oceanside community, carefully planned, best in fishing, wholesale amusement, sun fun, and east-west strand, which they, that was kind of their claim to fame around, and new and modern motel, which was the Barbie Motel, which is going to show up, which my dad uh, purchased in 1968, I believe it was, from Gil Barbie. Uh, next. Okay, this is really cool. I, I really appreciated getting these. Uh, this is a perspective uh, on the left and the right upper pictures is Barbie Boulevard in the very beginning. Wow. This is when it was just, I don't know, Mark, uh, you know, Mike knows and David. This is just the two rut roads, uh, just fully grown. This is like in, in the very beginning. This was it, when it was just getting started. The other picture that uh, what I've, the best I can figure on the bottom would be uh, up the main road. It was either on Womble or looking up Beach Drive toward Cows. And I can't exactly put my fingers on that one, but that's where I believe it is. Uh, next. Okay, this, uh, this perspective is from up where I was just saying, looking back at the completed pier. Of course, no oceanfront homes, a lot of space there, uh, which they had a lot, a lot of beach strand then also. Uh, next. Okay, this is cool. This is a, a crowded beach. Uh, uh, this is looking from the pier, looking down, and I'm guessing we're looking at maybe a dozen or maybe 15 people. Uh, this is in the summertime. I remember these days like this. 
kind of had the beach to yourself. Next slide. Uh, this is a, another construction picture. Uh, I'm guessing this is at the end. Uh, give you a perspective that's looking up Womble Street. The motel would come to the block there on the right. Uh, the pier house would be down in the bottom of the picture in front of the truck. And 801 Ocean would be there where the, uh, where the card and the little pile of stuff is at. So that's a, a very early picture also. Next. Okay, here we go. Uh, on the left, that is uh, that was the skating rink being built and the golf course at the same time. Uh, the little ramp, the little ramp you see there, the little boxing area, that was the uh, that was the final hole. That's where you when you're playing putt putt number eighteen, you hit the ball up there, it goes in, and you don't get it back. But that's <laughs> during the construction of that. That's the covered area uh, past behind the skating rink and the pier would be just to the other side of that out of out of view there where the truck is at and the fence was being put up for the putt putt and I, I do remember one thing about the putt putt it, a lot of sand blew in there uh during the off season or a lot of sand blew in there anyway so it was a lot of work for those guys to keep the the uh, artificial turf cleaned off where you could play uh, the other picture on the right shows Robert Sellers' house again over there on Barbie Boulevard and the fence being put up. This was before the bingo parlor snack bar slash surf shop would, would come. And there would be a, uh, a long covered area there, parking area with a canopy over it. And the next picture on the bottom is uh, uh, one of the construction guys looked like he found a little friend there while he was working. And uh, he probably didn't take him home with him. But it uh, looks to me to be a rattlesnake. Uh, next. <laughs> okay, this is uh, this, this scene you will see if you go in 801 Ocean now. Uh, this was when it was a skating rink in the very beginning. And uh, the windows, a lot of windows and a lot of boards on there. And uh, one of the guys, probably Frank Barbie, got, uh, had a little idea to stick a surfboard in there and use it for a rack. But that was to keep you from going out through the windows. But uh, I've done a lot of things in that building and it eventually turned into an arcade. And uh, of course now it's 801 Event Center for weddings and, and other parties and things going on. But that's it, that's when it was wide open from end to end. Next slide. Okay, uh, we have a putt-putt course now. This is outside 801, uh, the little 18 hole putt putt course with a fence completed with the people sitting on it. And uh, I probably knew some of the people in this picture, but I can't recognize anybody. But it was a, uh, looks like a crowded little night for that time. Uh, next slide. Okay, here we go. Uh, something I'm very familiar with. Uh, when I was probably five, four, five, six years old, uh, I rode the bumper cars. My mom was highly against it. My dad says, nah, he, he's riding them tonight. So dad put me in the bumper car with him and we were out there and we, we weren't going 30 seconds and we got slammed and I got a busted lip and was bleeding all over my shirt and all over my dad. So anyway, uh, that was my, I, ha I was asked to get out of the car and, but that's, that was a lot of fun. That was the bumper car building, which you're gonna see some more pictures of which turned into the Sand Fiddler dance hall and arcade. Uh, the picture on the left is the little kids train. Uh, the man's name just slipped my mind, but I know that's who it is. My friend Lynn remembers his name. I rode that little train many times. That is the original pier house, a uh, ground level pier house that was there. And the train was right out in the front in the parking lot. Uh, <laughs> next slide. Okay, this, uh, this young lady uh, is having a good time in a kiddie ride across from the motel. This is uh, on into the 60s. Uh, that's, that was the Barbie motel, which became my dad's on the left there. It's a 33 room motel, actually 32 rentable rooms because mom and dad had one of them in the middle. Uh, and then uh, in, in the early, I think dad bought that motel in 68 and in, 
I think around 70, he bought the other motel you see there, which was the Driftwood Motel uh, and ran it for several years before he sold it to the Judy uh, and Woody Newark. And then it became Newark's motel. But uh, that's, that's a young lady there having a good time in those little cars. And that was right in front of the pier house. Uh, next. Okay. Uh, the famous dance gazebo. Now, this, uh, to give you a perspective from where you're looking at, where it's from the street, kind of. I'm, I'm sorry, I I'm, got it backwards. It's from the ocean and 801 by the golf course. That's uh, the dual jukebox they had. Uh, go out there and put your money in, play your songs and dance. And then the, the place you see is the covered area where the parking was for the, uh, for the bingo and snack parlor, and which later became the surf shop. That's the covered area you see to the left. Okay, next slide. Okay, after the gazebo, uh, don't remember the year on this. Uh, after the gazebo closed down, this came about. This was a little cafe uh, and it had, you know, great food. Uh, I had ice cream, milkshakes, whatever you wanted. We're trying to find out the name of this guy because this has come up several times, but that's what the gazebo got turned into. That's uh, the reason for the roof angles and stuff that you see uh, that looks like that. But this was a, a little snack bar and restaurant. Okay, uh, next. Okay, some more shots. Uh, of course, the one on the left is looking up at the skating rink, the putt putt just to the left of that, the gazebo, and then the uh, bingo and snack bar with all the windows in it there. And this is a busy time. I don't know what time, this is summertime. Uh, this basically would be a 4th of July crowd, which is hard for people to, ima to imagine now, but. <laughs> That's a big crowd when I was that age right there, believe me. And, uh, and I just heard that this Labor Day, they, were, they said there was probably 3,500 people in the same area. But uh, that's what it looked like back in the day. Uh, on the right-hand side, you will see the motel, uh, the ground level pier building there at the end, the Barbie Motel, and then uh, that's Womble Street straight in front of the pier. And then you have uh, Kaziah, or sorry, Trot Street, and that's the building you see slight all the way over to the right with the open, that's the bumper cars. That, uh, that became the, the uh, sand fiddler with the bands and, uh, and, and games and stuff in it. I uh, used to listen to bands in uh, this, that left side in there. They closed it in and put the Florida aluminum crank out windows in there so you could bump your heads on them. And uh, my dad used to hold me up and I would watch the bands play in there. But that was called the Sand Fiddler then. Uh, I do see one beach house or a couple of beach houses over further up that have been there a long time. Uh, my house that we bought in 68, seven or eight, I believe it was, uh, is the furthest thing you see in that picture. That's about where our house was at. So I grew up about within 200 yards of that pier most of my life and lived there until 1990. Uh, next. Uh, some more kind of the same pictures, a colorized one and uh, the same buildings, you know, there's your, your gazebo. Uh, one of them I'm noticing doesn't have the gazebo that I can see, one of them does on the left. And uh, that's what you're looking at there. Uh, nice little lighting fixtures on the pier which now they're, they're new, uh, new technology lights for the turtles and everything, it doesn't affect them. Uh, back in the day, we weren't concerned about the turtles. We didn't bother them, we didn't uh, make runways for them and we didn't do all that stuff and they, uh, they did pretty good, I think. Uh, okay, next. Okay, this is uh, another shot on the left there uh, from my buddy, Doug Bartonfield, who uh, has been there like forever. That's a bottle opener he got from the, uh, from the pier house there. That's uh, about all we have in the souvenirs right now. There's the motel across the street, and a couple of cars running around. And you can see the skating rink there with the cars beside it on the left. Uh, next. Uh, basically the same shots. 
Uh, you're going to see some of these that are not exactly repeats, but we can go to the next slide. Uh, here we go again, completed pier uh, on the left here, a few people on the beach, uh, a lot of people on the beach on the right hand side picture. For the day, there was a lot of people there. And this is, uh, I'm sure, a, sum a summertime picture. Uh, next. Okay, uh, this, the picture on the, uh, this is 1963, January. Uh, I would be 10 years old. And that the pier is all completed. The sand dunes are starting to uh, increase in size there. This is on the left of the pier looking out. Uh, the middle picture, drive with care, 15 miles an hour. No bottles on the beach. Uh, we could drive on the beach then. Uh, that's hard for people to believe now. All you see now are employee town vehicles out there. But uh, like, like David, that Jeep, his, we had a, a 46 model Army Jeep. And Dad and I drove all over these beaches. We rode, went over sand dunes and there was nothing on the point. There wasn't a whole lot anywhere else. So driving on the beach was, uh, was allowed and it was a lot of fun. Uh, there's a picture of the gazebo on the one on the right. That's, that is actually a bingo parlor and a snack bar and ticket window there on the, uh, on the, on the right-hand side of that building by that power pole. That later became a uh, Frank Barbie surf shop. So uh, I think it was called the Seaside Surf Shop. And then I think, if, if I'm not mistaken, that David, the other David Ratcliffe uh, got involved with Frank on ownership of that. That's what I was told anyway. <laughs> okay. Does that sound right to you, David? Do you remember anything about that? I do not. No, I don't remember anything about it. But it sounds, but he was much cooler than me. So that sounds about right. Okay. Well, that's where <laughs> the guys hung out. That's where your Doug Barton feel, who basically brought surfing to North Carolina, uh, <laughs> to the Outer Banks, and uh, David Ratcliffe, uh, and uh, of course, Frank Barbie, uh, Gordon Davis, Cuff Davis, and all those guys around there. I was not a surfer. John Jones, Tommy Dozier, Mike Dozier, that's where all the guys went surfing. Probably Mark Royal too. I, I, I remember uh, the, the Davis, Gordon Davis, and the Dozers. I remember that. Yeah. But they were the cool kids. Yeah, they were they were the surfer guys. <laughs> I never became a surfer. I was not a, a really good swimmer. Uh, I used to throw their boards off the pier for them when it was too rough to paddle out. And, uh, <laughs> That was, that was, I couldn't understand that, but I said, you want me to throw your board in and you're going to jump off the end of the pier and get it? And they says, yeah, can you do that? And I said, certainly, but I'm not jumping over there with it. So <laughs> Tom said, no, you're not throwing my board off. I said, well, how are you doing this? He said, I'm jumping with it. So everybody would go in there. Tommy would wrap his arms around it and put his feet back. Of course, they had the, uh, the cord on there uh, to keep them from losing it. So Tommy dove off and plowed in, in like, a, you know, like a submarine and went in with his board and let it loose. But anyway, that's another story. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is looking, uh, the picture on the left, uh, I think must have been a Barbie family dog. I uh, don't know anything about this dog, but this is when there was nothing on the, nothing on the ocean front. There were no homes around. The picture on the right, uh, the best I can figure is looking up Barbie Boulevard, the way you would travel going uh, north. And that was probably Mrs. Barbie's yard with the boat out front. And that house actually is still there. Uh, it's been remodeled, but that's where uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Barbie lived at. Uh, next. Okay, this, this is kind of a cool picture. This is, uh, this gives you an overhead perspective of everything. Uh, and this is looking at the, the original pier house, the pier, uh, the, uh, the, art, the skating rink, the golf course you can see well. You can see uh, the gazebo, the dance gazebo. The green building was the bingo and, and snack bar, which later became the surf shop. And I think that surf shop came about in about 67 or 68. I'm not sure on that. Uh, you got the pier parking lot. Uh, you got the corner there across from the skating rink on, on Womble uh, where there's nothing. There would be rides there at one time after they were moved over from the oceanfront. 
before they went over to the Barbie block over there. They actually got moved over there in the late 60s and went into the 70s with them over there using a whole block. Uh, the motel is still the Barbie motel. Uh, this is pre-swimming pool. Uh, uh, across the road are the little kitty rides. Uh, there's a little, uh, a little boat, a little place out there with boats in it, a little kitty pool. Some of the things you saw, the bumper cars would be in the building to the left, uh, which got closed in and told, I told you it turned into a, uh, a dance hall with bands playing in there, bands from all over the state and local bands. Uh, and the little train was over there also. But that's, what, that's a good overhead view of everything. Uh, you can see Barbie where the circle's at to the far right. That's where you were able to drive around and you could go into the surf shop or whatever. To the, but that was a real popular spot. Uh, I used to sit on the corner, right almost in the very center of this picture, there's a car going by, well, there's two cars going by. But the car on the left right there, there's a power pole on the corner of that street. I used to sit right there with Ed Leonard, who was chief of police, and we would watch the cars race by. And uh, he was a much older guy. He was the only cop we had at that time. We started getting the auxiliary officers, but I, I called him chief. I would look at him. I said, chief, you going to get him? And I said, he says, I'll get him next time, son. So they would line up and race by there again. And I said, you're going to get him this time, chief? He says, no. So, uh, anyway, uh, that's just another little story on the side. But uh, next slide. Okay, this is a, this picture here came from the 68-69 Southport High School Dolphin Annual. This is uh, actually was made in 68 when Jim Bowen was owner manager. And uh, this was, of course, not the original Pier House. And I doubt the original, I think part of it's the original Pier. You can see it goes out with a straight ramp and then it drops down and goes back up again. But uh, there were many ownerships of that pier, and I know some of them. I know a lot of them. I don't know exactly. I've got uh, Jim Bowen in the late 60s, Archie Dixon, who also uh, had a rod and, he did rod and reel repair. Uh, Wes Westbrook was a manager one time. Merle and Dot Russell from the 70s to the maybe 84 sometime. Chris and Peter Outlaw took it over in the 80s and also built what they call the Orr House, O-A-R. That was in the back, the restaurant, and that was a uh, little place with lots of signs and lots of weird items hanging up from the ceiling. And that's where the bands would play. I played in there several times myself. And I remember the ocean splashing up underneath there and me wondering if we were gonna fall in the ocean sometime that night. But that was called the Orr House and that was the outlaws uh, that owned that. And they had a restaurant in there and that was a very popular bar and place to go to. Uh, then earlier in the years, they had a place that was uh, Ozzy's Chew and Choke. That was Ozzy Lee's uh, restaurant he had. I, I think Ozzy might have been a cook in the Navy, and Ozzy fixed some mighty fine food in there, but he named it Ozzy's Chew and Choke. But uh, next slide. Okay, this, is, uh, this was the originally... This is 1970. This was C.E. Murphy, who was the mayor for a long time. This was his restaurant and he built, it was a light Bermuda pink looking brick. It was called the Trade Winds. Uh, my daddy bought this restaurant. Uh, not only did he have the two motels and the Esso station, but he took it upon himself to do it up big like Doodle, like David said Doodle did and get a restaurant. So he would have all of the things you could gas your car up, stay somewhere and, and eat. So anyway, this was 1970. We painted it white and it was called Shea Steakhouse. It belonged to, uh, you know, my dad and Ed Nichols. But uh, that, those are my nephews and that was our dune buggy with the logo Shea, Shea Steak on it. I used to run that thing all over your on it. Had, them, had a big time in it. Those are my nephews, uh, David Allen and Gary in the picture. But that is to the, uh, if you're facing the pier, that would be over to the left. And you would know that now as the Lazy Turtle. So that's, that's the building you're looking at there. And that's 1970. Uh, next. Okay, the, this picture, I think that's my daddy's Lincoln covered in snow. 
and uh, his 73 Superior Motorhome. That's looking over at the pier house, which in that portion of the pier house would be uh, the restaurant. And uh, I think this might have been the snow we had March of 1980. But it, it was a nice snow, and uh, we had some great snowball fights for a week that, we, that the kids were out of school. And I actually was running an arcade on the corner of Barbie, which I just told you was the bumper car building. That building got moved over to the corner of Barbie in 60, about 69, I believe. So I opened my arcade March 1st of 1980. And this was the big snow we had. And uh, I didn't have heat in that arcade. Yeah, David was talking about the cottage being cold. Believe me, that wooden building with no insulation, with open eaves up under it, was cold. Kids were shooting pool with gloves on. You could see everybody's breath. Uh, my dad and my friend Mark were drinking brandy to stay warm, and we and it was packed out because the kids had nowhere to go. Uh, that was one good thing about this era. Uh, kids had places to go and things to do with arcades, whether it be Long Beach Pier, Ocean Crest Pier, Yokon. There were things to go and do, and and kids had something. My my arcade was open year round. The uh, the the arcade beside. The pier would normally close after Labor Day, and I always felt like they rolled up the sidewalks after Labor Day because all the tours were, they were gone. But uh, it, and that's another thing. Uh, next slide is good. Yeah. I think we have, should have another one. Uh, yeah, okay, cool. This is, uh, this was made from Dad's motel, that little, little wooden sign thing you see out there, something I threw together with a planner with it, but that's, uh, that is a great picture of the arcade there with ski ball signs, and it was called the flagship arcade. This is when it later on when it had the roll up doors in it uh, instead of the uh, the windows. And uh, there is the putt, the newer putt putt course just to the right of that where the palm trees are at. But that is 801 Ocean now you're looking at. Uh, next. Okay, this was the tra this was the uh, the Driftwood Motel. Uh, it became uh, several other names. Uh, that is no longer there. The town of Oak Island uh, bought this and demolished it. It is a public parking lot right now. But the, okay, next slide is good. Uh, this is a, a pier. A one after a pier after rebuilding. Uh, Asha is evidently not around here anywhere. Uh, there's no handrailing, as you can see, people are fishing, and there's no concerns. But uh, that, was, uh, that was another shot of the pier, evidently during a rebuilding. Next. Okay, another good shot. This, is, this shows a lot of different things. Uh, of course, you see the pier, you see uh, the arcade, the, the, all the putt-putt area. Uh, the first house is right above the pier there that you see with the uh, salt box shaped roof on it. That was one of the first cottages in there. Uh, the looks like the restaurant there on the front with the rock, dad was able to get all of that rock brought in like they did down by the pier. Uh, this was scrap rock from broken bridge pilings from the new bridge and some of the demolition of the old bridge that got taken out in, uh, in you know, uh, Labor Day of 71. Uh, there are, you can see the beach houses are, have increased a lot and the Oak Island Beach Bill is up there a little bit further up. You can actually see some of the golf course to the left there with all the green grass. But this uh, shows both, uh, there are actually three motels. Uh, the, the, the motel to the uh, left of center, which is two story with the pool there in front of it, that was Murphy's Motel, which later became the Ocean Beach Resort. Uh, our home is just to the left of that. You see what looks like to be a garage kind of by itself on a, just above center to the left. That is my dad's garage. And our house is right beside that. But uh, that's your Yopon aerial view. Uh, and it's still, the Barbie Boulevard in there are still, you're still able to go around as you can see there with a couple vehicles parked. 
the uh, next slide. Okay, and this is bringing you up to pretty current. This is the uh, this is 801 Ocean. Uh, the little to the right of that, between the palm trees, is the which is still there. And people ask me when I've been doing events there, what what is that? That is the uh, the putt putt shed. That's where they brought the clubs in. That's where you you bought your ticket to play putt putt. So that that still exists. Or at least last week when I was over there, it was still there. I never know anymore. But there are a lot of cottages. The rest of that land there to the right are huge beach homes. They're almost like mini hotels. So that that little area uh, is the only thing left. And there is a beach home there, but it's right beside that putt putt shelter. But uh, that I think that might be all the slides. Oh, nice. One more to close it out. That's a, uh, the pier within after the rebuilding. So uh, the, new, the new lights on it. I don't remember exactly when I took this picture, but it was not too awful long ago. Okay, next. Okay. That's it. Uh, talking about, I don't know how we are on time, but talking about the economic thing of the pier, it was huge because you had people and that came down to fish. They stayed in a motel. They had to eat. They bought groceries. They bought gasoline. Kids had a job, a place to work. A lot of local kids uh, got jobs at the pier complex and the other businesses. And so uh, then there were, you know, a lot of the people were basically from North Carolina, I would say, and a lot of local people frequented these places because uh, there weren't thousands of tourists then. But the Barbies had a great vision of, with that village of what they needed with all the necessities there. And then you had the red and white grocery store. You had Harrelson's in Southport. Uh, you had a couple little gas stations and stores, a few motels. So basically you had what you needed, but the, the pier uh, was a big factor for the economy of, of the whole island. So that's pretty much it, guys. I lived, I lived there on Norton Street until 1990. We moved off. Uh, we knew things were changing and we moved out here to Bolivia, the Bolivia area and built out here on the farm. Thanks, Tommy. That was great. David, thank you as well. Sure. Bob, do we have any questions for these guys? I have a couple of comments from, um, from, from Facebook. Uh, uh, well, Catherine, Catherine Huffman um, <clears throat> saying to both uh, Tommy and, and David, what a, what a great job, job they did. And then uh, Fred Walton notes that he was there in 67 and he bought a pair of skates from the roller rink for a dollar fifty. I actually went skating in that roller rink when it when I was a kid, but you know I was too little to actually skate myself, so my parents, you know, were carrying me around. <laughs> well, I have to say, Tommy, I, I appreciated seeing your uh, perspective of some of the entertainment back because I. I had totally forgotten that I used to go over there and play putt putt, and we used to do bumper cars, and we. So I, I just had forgotten all of that till I saw it. So yeah. that was fun. Thank you. Same thing, David, yeah. on, the green, on the Long Beach Pier, because uh, when I was little, the first place I stayed was the Nicholsworth Cottage, which was a Hazel survivor, which yeah. is probably a half a mile from Long Beach Pier. So yeah. our kids walk down the walk down the hot asphalt. Or on the beach, whatever we chose, and went to Long Beach Pier. <laughs> that was our, our go-to place. <laughs> but anyway, guys, it's, it's been a pleasure uh, and an honor to be asked to do this. I really enjoyed it. Thank you both. I know we both could probably use another hour, or at least maybe a couple hours, but <laughs> it's something different on the, on the whole area later on. I know you reminded me of a lot of things I failed to mention in my presentation that I should have. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you got to go first because I remembered some things. <laughs> okay. okay, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> Any more questions? Okay, are we, we going to wrap it at that, Bob? Liz? Uh, 
Thanks, so. unless there's, if there's any questions, any, any comments? Uh, okay, but, and, and David and Tommy, let, let me, you know, <clears throat> say great job. Thanks, thanks very, very much. All right. You're certainly welcome, enjoy it. Okay, come back again. <laughs>